them a warm uh, round of applause and welcome. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. So we are here to talk about uh, ELK audio operating system and why you need it. So given where we are, I am assuming that most of you are audio developers and probably writing software for Windows, Mac OS, uh, or mobile. But what if you'd want to run your stuff on hardware? Let's say you want to make a standalone product that looks cool with many controls, maybe display, and sounds great. Which tools are available today for doing that? First option, use a digital signal processor, like the one that Texas Instruments or analog device make. Well, these are pretty good in terms of performance over price. They guarantee deterministic execution of your code, which means great latency. The problem, and I know for scan, uh, is that they are terrible to work with. You have to dig at a very low level, writing C, even assembly, debug over JTAG, uh, and you're not guaranteed that the code that you write today will run on the newer version tomorrow. Furthermore, they only do DSP. So if you need to do control, UI, updates, you need to integrate them with another chip. You can use FPGAs or bare metal microcontrollers, uh, other solution. The details are different than DSP, but the bottom line is the same. They are, you have great performance, they are hard to work with, uh, and you don't get all the benefits that you are used on a normal operating system. So last option, embedded Linux. Uh, you can, this is becoming more and more popular these days, uh, even in musical instruments. So you can choose a, a system on chip uh, where you can run both the DSP and the UI and the control code uh, in an integrated solution, which simplifies also the hardware design and hardware production. You get great development tools, uh, all the libraries you're used to, uh, device drivers for USB displays, networking, but you also get all the problems of a normal PC at the same time. So suddenly your audio starts to glitch, latency is a big issue, and sure, you can spend a lot of time using the preempt RT patch, tweaking all the details, uh, making sure that your code runs uh, at a certain level, but there's not really a solution ready that you can just choose. And also the Linux distributions like Debian, Arch, uh, they are not meant to be used in an embedded product. Uh, you want something that the user, no matter when you turn off the power, it's guaranteed to be stable and robust. So this prepackaged solution doesn't really exist, or, well, maybe, maybe it does now. Thank you. So, to address all these trade-offs, we have created the ELK audio operating system. The most important feature. With ELK, you can get as low as one millisecond round-trip latency in a deployed instrument that your end customer has in hand and can use with that performance. You get that great performance to cost ratio because ELK is so optimized for audio. You get to use the entire processing power in the chip that you choose and you get to really use low latency for that chip. So what are the other advantages? Uh, we recently announced that our code base will be entirely open source dual license. Uh, ELK is, as I mentioned, ready for industrial strength products. It's very important to stress, it is a professional development platform. It's not a maker tool, it is a platform for tomorrow creating instruments that will be deployed to the mass market. Uh, we provide any connectivity you would want for integrating your instrument into ecosystems of other music devices. And we have bindings for integrating knobs, encoders, LEDs, and screens. And also, it's portable across architectures and platforms. So, what's the underlying technology? At the core is our custom Linux distribution, which has a dual kernel setup so that you can maximize the CPU utilization and minimize latency. The end result is that audio processing 
always only happens in the Xenomai real-time kernel, uninterrupted. It works on ARM and x86 CPUs, and you get connectivity over Wi-Fi and Bluetooth low energy. And Elk supports all the plugin standards that you would expect, the most popular ones. And we have also native support for control voltage and gate input and output. And finally, we also get Ableton Link integration. So, given this is a conference hosted by Rolly and Juice, uh, it's uh, very relevant to draw a parallel to Juice. So, just like Juice allows targeting several platforms and formats so that once you write one single code base, you can build binaries for all the plugin formats and all the various operating systems that you would want your code to be deployed on, and you can just get the complexity hidden by Juice and concentrate on just making great audio software. The same way, Elk hides the complexity of making audio hardware. So we can all focus on what we really do best. So what we recently released is the Elk development kit, which consists of the Elk Pi hat, which is open source hardware to the point that you can download the zip file from our repository, send it as it is to a manufacturer and order a thousand copies, we'll be happy. You don't have to pay us anything. We'd be glad if you told us. And that way we will know about how our baby is used in the world. Uh, we have an optional control board which we created for this conference, uh, which exposes the audio and control voltage inputs and outputs, as well as has a few buttons, LEDs, MIDI DIN, and a little OLED screen. This isn't currently available for purchase. We are making a better one. And uh, if you subscribe to our newsletter, you will find out more about when that one is getting out. Uh, as part of the development kit, you get a cross compilation tool chain to build for the platform and app images for desktop Linux so that you can very quickly iterate when developing without having to even boot your device up while you just test your program. And of course, documentation, examples, and a large library of pre-built open source plugins that I'm gonna tell you about next or later. So currently, the supported CPUs that we have are the Intel Atom CPU, several versions, uh, the Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B Plus, which is what we've developed the Elk Pi for. Uh, Raspberry Pi 4 support is coming in the first quarter of next year. And we also have support for the IMX 7 and 8 system on chip systems. So now my colleague Gustav is gonna tell you about the architecture. Thank you. So now you heard what, what Elk is and sort of what you can do with it. Um, sounds amazing, right? One millisecond latency, wow. Um, so a little look at what is under the hood of Elk. Um, this is a diagram of some of the different, like the main components that uh, make up Elk. Um, the stuff that is pictured here in blue are the parts that are provided by the underlying Linux distribution. Um, the gray and the yellow part is components that we at Elk provide and in order to make a complete musical device or instrument with it, you also need to supply the parts in green. So starting at the bottom, we have uh, the dual kernel set up. So this is a Xenomai real-time kernel running side by side with a Linux kernel where we do the audio processing in the real-time kernel. Um, that way we can go up to 80, even 90% CPU load for the audio. Um, you can't go to 100% because you would need to leave a little bit of space for the actual Linux distribution to run. Um, but you can get pretty close and the always is, audio is always top priority. Everything else is secondary. And on top of that, we have a digital audio workstation. Um, it's a plug-in host that loads plugins in most of the common formats. Um, it has audio and MIDI routing. It has as many tracks as the CPU allows. It has multi-threaded audio processing, Ableton Link, MIDI, everything. Um, an important thing to note is that the GUI, we don't provide any graphical user interface for, uh, for the host. 
Uh, we do provide a control interface over OSC or gRPC so that users of Elk can use it to build GUIs with their own look and feel. Uh, but the GUI would need to run in a separate process. Um, but if that process is on the same machine as Elk or if it's in a completely different device like a handheld device, tablet, uh, laptop, it is up to you. We also have a sensor daemon that makes it very easy to connect things like uh, potentiometers, switches, LEDs without doing all the low level coding. You can specify in a JSON file what, what hardware you have, which pins they are connected to, and you can use that to control parameters on plugins, for instance, um, without having to do all the low level coding like debouncing of switches or counting clicks on encoders, because we have that covered. Um, we also have some small but crucial features in order to build an industrial strength product, like a software update system, um, that you can update the whole software from, say, a USB stick. Um, and it's based on a dual partition system that makes sure that it's stable, that you cannot say if you would pull the plug in the middle of an update operation that you could not brick the device by doing so. Um, we also use uh, system D and some other things from uh, the Linux distribution to do automatic scripting at startup, start things up when you boot the device. Um, and outside of the main DSP, one of the most important things you need to provide to make a complete instrument with Elk is this uh, main app, or internally we sometimes refer it as the glue app, because it's a little script that sort of connects everything together. If you want to make, say, dynamic mapping of knobs to parameters, if you want to light up an LED when something happens, you want to connect program changes to a button or something, you want to inject some kind of logic into that. This is uh, the place where you do it. And you can write this in more or less any languages. What you need is support for gRPC and OSC, and that exists in many languages. Though in all our examples, uh, we've written this in Python, and we would recommend Python for prototyping or C++ for a industrial strength product. Um, if you are not up to speed with gRPC, we've also provided some thin wrappers so to abstract that away to make it easy to get started. So that is a little overview of what's under the hood of Elk. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the plugins because for someone to build an instrument with Elk, most of the focus would probably be on building the plugins that run in it. And that's exactly what we want. We want developers to focus on the plugins, on the audio uh, processing algorithms, and not on the boring parts of building uh, a hardware instrument. So some of the tools that you can use to build plugins with Elk, I, mean, I think this is, all of it is things that you, you recognize. You can code directly against the, the VST2 and 3 APIs. Um, in VST3, we have official support by Steinberg for Elk since I think it's version 3.6.11. Uh, you can use Juice, obviously, to build your plugins. We have a fork of Juice uh, on our GitHub to make uh, headless plugins. We've used the well, fluid synth library to build uh, instruments with sound fonts. LV2 is the most common plugin format on Linux, and it works. Heist is a pretty cool uh, open source contact-like uh, sampler framework. Uh, and you can also use uh, specialized audio languages like, like Faust uh, and C sound. So most of it is, is very much the same as writing plugins for a laptop. Um, but just a few notes on some of the things that might differ a little bit. Um, first thing, your plugin needs to be compiled for Linux. And if it works for Linux, you can cross compile it for an Elk platform. And we provide cross compiling tool chains to make that essentially as easy as compiling for the native architecture. Um, the other thing is that plugins need to be headless, so they need to compile without. Uh, large graphical UI dependencies, um, and they need to be controllable using the plugin API, whether that's the VST2 or 3 or LV2 uh, interface. Um, 
real-time safety, I mean, we're all audio developers here. We know that there's certain things we shouldn't do in the audio thread to keep real-time safety, like you know, memory allocations, uh, system calls, etc. And this is even more true for Elk. Um, I should note that due to the nature of the Xenomai dual, dual kernel that we're using, um, doing a system call in the audio thread causes a kind of, we call it a mode switch, where the kernel switches to a secondary mode to call the Linux kernel, and this has a heavy performance penalty. Um, they also note that there are a few system calls related to timers and threading that are safe on a normal, a regular Linux distribution, but on a Xenomai uh, real-time kernel, these are a bit unsafe. So we've provided a Twine, which is a utility library, to abstract away those things for you. Um, next, Elias will talk about the example plugin that we showed in our workshop on Monday. So this plugin was created only using Juice, using the building blocks that Juice provides to create polyphonic sample playback, a low pass resonant filter, and reverb. Uh, you see just four controls for those exposed on the plugin's uh, user interface. What's most important to note here is this plugin cross-compiles completely unmodified for Elk and runs beautifully on the platform. And what we wanted to demonstrate with this plugin is one way with which you could integrate your software running on the desktop with the same instance, or sorry, the instance running on the Elk Pi. So what we've done is we use open sound control messages to communicate the parameter changes on one to the other so that they both have the same state at all times. So if you uh, manipulate the slider on the screen on your desktop instance, then the instance running on Elk will receive a message to set that parameter to the same value as the desktop. And if you turn a knob on the device changing a value, there will be an open sound control message going the other way to the desktop instance, meaning the slider jumps to that value or, well, transitions. And so you can use the desktop instance as just a GUI. You can have both producing sound, or you could just use one or the other, and you get a seamless experience. It's the same software running on the desktop and on the hardware, to the point that they really also share the same state. We mentioned that we have built a large number of open source plugins for the platform, just to convey how very easy it is to cross compile. I mean, we got up to a number of about 500, and it will be growing. Uh, many of them, you just build them, you run them on the platform, it's fine. For some, we've had to do some small changes, but as you see by the number, those changes cannot have been big. Uh, the logos for some of our favorites are on the screen. The OBXT, a wonderful synthesizer, we have the Air Windows plugin collection, the Temper Phase Distortion, the LKJB plugin collection, the Colf Studio Gear plugin collection. This goes on. These will be available as binaries on our GitHub, ped, uh, GitHub page pretty soon. So I'll give the word to Stefano to cover the topic of licenses. Yeah, and uh, before that, I guess the question uh, that uh, you might be wondering, uh, how much does it cost? Where do I get it? Well, you have a flyer with a discount code in your bag, so you can order this on our website with 40% discount. So that's a pretty big offer. We did only for the ADC participants. And the software, the cost for the software is zero. In the, the upcoming weeks, we're going to release everything on GitHub. And the strategy is the classical dual licensing strategy. So the open source version is going to be a very on the copyleft part. Sushi and Sensei will be Afero GPL3 and the other parts GPL3. This basically means that if you release a product based on the open source license, we would like you to contribute your code to the community as well, including the plugins and any application that communicates with Sushi or Sensei. If you want to keep your code secret, contact us for a commercial license. So I think we are running a little bit uh, later. Do we have time for a quick demo, 30 seconds? 
Okay, so let me change a few settings here. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what? What we would like to show you here is this uh, quick prototype that one of our developers who's sitting back there in the corner just did in literally a bunch of hours using a few open source plugins uh, and the Python API to create what looks like actually almost a finished product. So there is a small tiny OLED display uh, and uh, you can change uh, the plugin parameters, the plugin type, uh, you can move uh, uh, the exposed parameters and actually these are uh, the names and the values are queried from the host. So there's uh, the, the, the Python code is pretty much generic. And uh, there's even if it works now, let's see, a step sequencer, so we can play around Sorry. with the filter parameter, we can uh, increase the reverb, and whatever, and uh, Play a little bit with the step sequencer itself. Oh, sorry, the display, the display got lost, <laughs> got lost. This is a, this is a problem of live demo and a problem of uh, cheap other fruit displays. So <laughs> the display went to black uh, because <laughs> it lost the connection. <laughs> anyway, okay, that's that. <laughs> all, all right. So back to the presentation. Slides, but maybe if you want to leave some time for questions, so yeah, that's the demo and uh, uh, can you help me with this? Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, you yeah. Let's just. Okay, let's thank you, Cleasa. But we are done uh, and we have time for a few questions now. Thanks. Um, does your um, kit that you can order, does it come with a pre-flashed SD? Uh, no, but it's pretty simple to flash. We will provide uh, a, a, any image that you can flash on any SD card. Oh yeah, okay. So, so that's pretty simple. Okay, cool. Hello, I was wondering uh, how, um, how sort of tight is the dependency on the two uh, single board computers that you are currently supporting or is it easily uh, ported? You know, there's a pretty wide range now of kind of $50 kind of little uh, maker computers out there running different ARM processors, that kind of thing. Is, is it a platform that will support more and more of those platforms in future or? Uh, which platform, sorry? Uh, well, I mean, there's things like the Odroid, there's okay, so um, you're Banana Pie, all of those. If I understood the question, you are asking uh, uh, how many ARM platforms can we support and how easily, right? Yeah. Okay, so if uh, Elk uh, um, doesn't really depend on Xenomai, we actually have Elk running on Preamp 30 as well with worse performance. So in that case, we can support pretty much any platform support Linux. For the Xenomai specific support, uh, we are pretty good at supporting new chips, uh, but uh, that's something that takes uh, a lot of effort and time. Um, in uh, next year, for example, we'll have the, the NXP IMX8 M Mini, but generic ARM, uh, well, sometimes might be easy, sometimes impossible, depends uh, on what the system chip provider, sometimes they don't provide uh, uh, the full uh, kernel source code or is very different from mainline, so those things are almost impossible. So it varies a lot, but it, it takes time to support a new platform. Yeah. Thank you. 
we've got time for one more question. So. Um, so, how can we? Is how many inputs does it have, and what kind of inputs? That, yeah. Uh, you can find the specs on our site, but uh, very quickly, it has the, on the audio side, you have uh, six inputs, eight outputs, and with these jumpers, you can uh, decide if they are at the control voltage level or audio level. Okay. And then we packed it with uh, 16 analog sensor inputs, 32 digital inputs, and 32 digital outputs. So it, you can make many things with this alone. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much.